So once again, with our greatest integer function, we can see that because the limit from the right-hand side is equal to a, which is where f of a is defined at, if a is an integer, we can see then then f of x, our greatest integer function, is continuous from the right. Now, if we look at it graphically, if we jump backwards, and we see here this is in fact our greatest integer function, we can see that it makes sense that if we come from the right, we have this continuity, right? We see that there are no holes and that it is defined on the right-hand side, whereas on the left it is not. Now, a function f is continuous on an interval i if it is continuous at every number in the interval i. So it is possible that you have discontinuities on the ends, right? So like in this first situation where it's defined at different values, on the endpoints, but it's continuous in between. Or it can be fully defined on one side um, and then defined not at the point that it needs to be to be continuous. So these are just different possibilities. But in all of these cases, it is continuous in between those endpoints in the interval. So here it's from A to B open, here closed A to B, open to closed B, and closed A to closed B. Example four, if we look at function f of x equals one minus the square root of one minus x squared is continuous on the interval, on the closed interval, negative one to one. Okay, so in order to prove this, we need to first prove that f of a, where a is in this closed interval, is defined for all values in this. So let's start there. Let's let a be a value that is in this interval. So let a belong to this interval negative one to one. And the symbol here just means belong to. So as long as a is in this interval, then let's check f of a is equal to one minus the square root of one minus a squared will in fact be defined because in this situation, we are smaller than the absolute value of one. Therefore, we can square root because the only time where this particular function is not defined is when one minus x squared results in a negative. So we know that our only domain issues occur when this one minus x squared is less than zero. So we know that cannot have this situation here. That is one must be less than x squared and that x squared must be between um, if we square root, must be between negative 1, x must be between negative 1 and 1 for this to be true, which is what we have in this case. So our function is defined so long as this occurs. So we're good here in saying that this is continuous on this interval, negative 1 to 1. Now we need to check our limits from the left and the right. So let's approach... Um, our endpoint on our left. So let's approach x is approaching negative 1, and we're going to come at it from the right of f of x. And we're going to get the limit as if x approaches negative 1 from the right, and then that of that 1 minus square root of 1 minus x squared. And then note we're plugging in something just to the right. Um, so like um, a negative 0.99999, right? So something right before we hit that negative one um, value. 
So this essentially will behave in that manner, right? As that one minus the square root of one minus, um, just for the sake of this, to play with this, we'll say like a negative point nine 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 nine, right? Squared. And then just playing around with this with the calculator. Um, point nine 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 squared gives us this, which is essentially zero. So we square root zero, we get zero. So this basically comes out one. Now similarly, let's check our other side. So we're going to approach one, but we're gonna come out one from the left side of our interval. And we have the limit as x approaches one from the left of our one minus the square root of one minus x squared. And similarly, we're going to plug in a really small value right before one, like a 0.99999 squared. And once again, we'll see that we result in this square root of zero. So this basically is one. And we can see that, yes, the limit does exist, right? So we can see that the limit of f of x um, from the left and the right hand side um, exist and equal the, the value of the function at those points. So we are then going to say, um, based on this continuity on the interval, um, that it's continuous at those endpoints, right? And it's defined everywhere in this. Um, there's no holes. So we're going to say, yes, that f of x is continuous on our closed interval. Interval negative one to one. So just note in situations like this, um, first obviously identify domain issues um, and then verify that the interval that you're playing with um, satisfies those domain issues and then check what happens when you approach each side of the interval from, from the right and from the left. All right, let's introduce theorem four and it says this. If functions f and g are continuous at a and c is a constant, then the following functions are also content, continuous at a. The sum, f plus g, the difference, f minus g, the constant times the function, and then the two functions, product, and the two functions, quotients, so long as g of a is not zero. And then theorem five, part a, any polynomial function is continuous everywhere, that it is continuous on all reals, that is negative infinity to infinity. And then any rational function is continuous wherever it is defined, that is, it is continuous on its domain. Let's take a look at example five. So example five here gives us a rational function. Um, we know that because this is a rational function, it is continuous everywhere on its domain. Our only domain issues will occur when this five minus three x is equal to zero, which is when five is equal to three x, or when x is equal to five thirds. So we know that our function f is continuous everywhere except for five thirds. They want us to find the limit of f of x as x approaches negative two. Since that is a part of the domain, we're gonna go ahead and just do this by direct substitution. So we get negative two cubed, two times negative two squared, minus one over five minus three times negative two. This becomes negative eight plus, let's try that again, negative eight plus two times four. So that's eight minus one over five and the negative three times negative two is six. So this becomes zero and negative one over 11. 
So our limit here is negative 1 11. So note here, we can make two statements. Um, we can say that the limit of f of x um, is continuous everywhere except for at 5 thirds. Um, or sorry, that f of x, the function, is continuous everywhere except for 5 thirds. And that the limit of f of x as x approaches negative 2 is negative 1 11. Okay, and that's it. So now it's your turn to try some. So um, our practice for today is page four, 142 through 145, 11 through 17, and 21 to 35 odd. Feel free to message me with any specific questions as you work.